More now on the pandemic, and we want to get to some of your questions tonight when it comes to the latest wave of COVID-19. Dr. Monica Gandhi is a professor of medicine and associate division chief at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Gandhi, appreciate your time tonight. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. I'd like to start with something you and I have discussed before, and that's the metrics, how we're tracking the virus at this point. We still use case counts as a markers, but uh, you have said that you believe we should be using hospitalization, hospitalizations and even deaths as a metric to track the virus. Why is that so important? Um, because essentially the virus has properties that will make it endemic and there's nothing we can do about that. We can't eradicate the virus and it really has nothing to do with human behavior. There are animal reservoirs. It looks like a lot of other viruses. We don't have sterilizing immunity to our vaccines. So it's going to be around. And what we need to do is prevent severe disease. And ever since we've had vaccines, we've had this uncoupling of cases and hospitalizations. It's not, never been more dramatic than it is now with Omicron in highly vaccinated or immune places, really high cases, really low hospitalizations and deaths. That uncoupling has happened. In South Africa, with 25% vaccination, but 76% total seroprevalence, and in the US around the country. And that uncoupling means we need to track hospitalizations as our metrics for restrictions and how we're doing with the virus. So do you believe that the numbers that we're seeing now counting the cases is is unwarranted in terms of the concern that we're seeing nationwide? Well, number one, we still have to count cases and Philippines and Singapore still do that. But what they have both decided to do is they don't report out the cases to the public because it can lead to a lot of panic. What they do instead is they're following those in health departments, just like we follow influenza cases every winter. You just didn't know that because we don't report them and we tell the public about hospitalizations. So what you do is you report out the hospitalizations from COVID with COVID, uh, not just in the nose, but it has to get to be hospitalized for COVID. So there's also, you, we also swab everyone in the hospital. We put that out to the public and follow cases by health department. What will it take to get to that point? You know, I think once we see this Omicron surge pass, which hopefully mid-January, if we're going to be anything like South Africa and the UK, that mid-January will peak and then go down, we're going to see that we already are seeing that uncoupling of cases and hospitalizations. 63% of hospitalizations in, the, in South Africa were incidental, meaning they just had it in their nose. This is a large study. So we need good data on hospitalizations. Once we see that uncoupling, I think that the United States is going to go to, okay, we're not going to tell you about cases. We're going to follow them, I promise. Um, but we, we are going to tell you about hospitalizations, how your region's doing. California is doing very well compared to where at this time last year, which was very difficult. Yeah, just understanding a different way to view where we're at in the pandemic. The other big discussion happening right now, Dr. Gandhi, is the guidelines on the quarantine have changed now at five days. This has confused a lot of people yet again uh, in the midst of all of this. So what is that decision based on? And what do we know now that we didn't know six months, a year ago? Well, it's a great question. So isolation is when you've tested positive and that's five days you need to be away from people and then it's five days for uh, with a mask. And then quarantine is if you've been exposed and the idea is that you kind of stay away or you wear a mask for the whole 10 days. Okay, so what? why did they change it? Two reasons. One is that a large contact tracing study from Taiwan, which was much earlier actually, it was November 2020, showed us that all the transmission occurred within the first five days of us getting symptoms. We've known that for a little while, actually, but the other reason that they changed it, to be fair, is that um, everyone's getting Omicron and they're going to keep people at home on the maximal time is when you're likely to transmit, which is within the first five days. And then after that, keep a good mask on for the next five days. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fair at this phase of the pandemic to do that. Should we have done it sooner? It would have made it easier to do it sooner, um, actually. Uh, and that's not a unfair point. Um, but uh, it's at least with this many people getting Omicron, it's really making life difficult. People are being out. We need to shorten that isolation period. And it was the right thing to do. The other thing I'm hearing, reports of doctors having a difficult time distinguishing between Omicron and the other variant, Delta. How is that complicating or impacting treatment? 
That's a very good question because um, the UK and South Africa was almost entirely Omicron, but the CDC revised their estimates last week that we thought we had 74% Omicron and they actually downgraded it to 59% and the rest is Delta. So what that means, and the reason that's so important to know is we can use a monoclonal antibody. Most of them work, the, the ones that we typically use with Delta, but only one works with Omicron, so it was very important for us to know that. And how can we tell that someone has Delta or Omicron in the hospital? Unfortunately, no other way but to sequence it. So the CDC does need to do better genomic surveillance and tell us where we are with the percentage of Omicron Delta this week. It does feel like a lot of catch up. I wanna to get to a couple of viewer questions for you, Dr. Gandhi. Uh, the first one comes from Charlie Davis on Twitter, and he wants to know, will we need a COVID-19 vaccine each year, essentially like a flu shot? So it's unlikely that we will. So why have we never needed variant specific boosters? Because your immune system um, is very adaptable. The T cells, which is an arm of the immune response that you develop, work against the whole variant. And your B cells that you also produce, if they see the variant, a variant in the future, they just make antibodies directed against that variant. We have four papers that show us this now. So once you get that B and T cell immunity, you can adapt your immunity to the variant that you see in front of them, in front of you. And we shouldn't need this so often. We just needed it right now because we were going through the Omicron surge and there were so many more cases. Just to follow on that though, will we still need more boosts after we've gotten the third shot, potentially a fourth? I will tell you that it's all going to depend on how much we can reduce transmission and how much we can get the rest of the world vaccinated so that it's not running around to the same degree that it's been running around this virus. So it's hard to tell that right now. But the only virus that we've ever needed yearly shots for is influenza, and that's because it changes so much. So we can't tell that right now, but I don't think we're going to need yearly shots for all right, and real quick, um, I only have a couple of seconds here, Dr. Gandhi, but I've got a question from Jody wants to know, should we be worrying about a new variant out of France called B16402? Not yet. In fact, we shouldn't. Actually, it was detected much earlier than this, and now it's sort of raised its head. It was there before December 6th. It in no way looks like it's taking over. We have enough to worry about right now. We don't need to worry about this one. Agreed on that. All right, Dr. Monica Gandhi, as always, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.